Welcome back, Mitochondria X. It's Dr. People for another episode of Cancer as a Mitochondrial Metabolic Disease. Today, as promised, we're going to talk about some of the most important factors for the mitochondrial cristae formation, which is going to help us form the necessary mitochondrial super complexes to help maximize energy output, to maximize electron transport efficiency, and to minimize any excess reactive oxygen species, reactive nitrogen species, which is going to lead to oxidative stress and damage. I'm going to reiterate that ROS and RNS are not bad. They are necessary. They are a necessary exhaust or a necessary byproduct of energy metabolism and mitochondrial redox. I want to reiterate that we don't want to just stop completely mitochondrial ROS or reactive oxygen species because that would lead to essentially no life at all. And when I mean no life, I mean death. We need there to be some degree of reactive oxygen species. We will see this in grave detail during the mitochondrial redox micro series, but we're not there yet. So let's continue on and talk about the important factors for mitochondrial super complex formation. So mitochondrial complex one plays an essential role in human respirosome. That's another name of saying mitochondrial super complex assembly. The biogenesis and function of mitochondrial respiratory chain involved the organization of respiratory chain enzyme complexes and super complexes or respirosomes through an unknown biosynthetic process. Now this paper was published in 2012. So this was a theoretical concept at this time. We now know that this super complex does form. We've got the structure and we're now understanding the importance of its function. We show that in human cells, respirosome biogenesis involves a complex one assembly intermediate acting as a scaffold for the combined incorporation of complexes three and four subunits rather than originating from the association of pre-assembled individual holoenzymes. The process ends with the incorporation of complex one NADH dehydrogenase catalytic module, which leads to the respirosome activation. So that is a lot of words to basically say that complex one is the backbone of the mitochondrial supercomplex. And without that, the other complexes do not freely associate to form the supercomplex. And they have determined this by doing knockout studies where they actually make it to where complex one is damaged and or doesn't assemble correctly. And they find that the energy conversion collapses, the supercomplex does not form, and the mitochondrial membrane with the proton gradient also collapses. So there is no energy produced to the degree that it can be produced when mitochondrial complex one or respiratory complex one is not assembled correctly. So the plasticity model, that supercomplex formation is a form of adaptation to changing conditions such as energy supply, redox state, and stress. Complex 1, the NADH dehydrogenase, is part of the largest supercomplex, C134. Here we demonstrate the role of a subunit of the membrane arm of complex 1 in complex 1 and supercomplex assembly on the one hand and bioenergetic function on the other. This knockout, this is just basically, a, as we've talked about, these mitochondrial complexes that make up complex 1 through 5 are basically made up of several proteins. So these are kind of super complexes on their own. But the bottom line is they were able to knock out a key important protein that helps the complex one form. And when they knocked that out, there was a correlation between a scaffolding protein called SCAF1, a super complex assembly factor, and reduction of respiration and mitochondrial membrane potential. So I think the picture probably is the best way to illustrate this. So we see that when mitochondrial complex one is intact, we have efficient proton gradient formation. We have efficient electron transport and super complex formation, which leads to a great membrane potential and energy conversion. However, when we knock out this NDU FB10, when we knock that out, the complex one cannot form effectively. Therefore, the respirosome does not form effectively. And then we have a collapse in energy production, aka very little ATP is produced in comparison. And we have a collapse of the mitochondrial membrane because protons cannot build the gradient to cause the redox power of the mitochondria to function. So we see that complex one is the first major factor in creating the mitochondrial super complex. Okay, moving on. So another important factor is going to be this optic atrophy one protein, which is part of the mycos complex. We talked about the mycos and how it's important for crista formation. We've also talked about how the mycos is made up of dozens of different proteins, but one of the most important proteins is called OPA1. And when OPA1 is functional and adequate, it's going to allow the mycos to be controlled and shaped in a way that maximizes super complex formation. And what it's saying is the mitochondrial complex site and crystal organization system 
system, Mikos, and Optic Atrophy 1, OPA 1, control Chris's shape, thus affecting mitochondrial function and apoptosis. Whether and how they physically and functionally interact is unclear. Here, we provide evidence that OPA 1 is epistatic to Mikos and the regulation of Christus shape. So this OPA 1, we're going to see as an important factor in maintaining adequate Christus shape and super complex formation. And as you can see here, OPA 1 forms at the top of the actual Christa where it begins to form and holds it together so that the rest of the actual Christa can be tightly held together and Furthermore, OPA-1 regulates respiratory supercomplex assembly, the role of mitochondrial swelling. So as you can see, when you have damage or deletion, even worse, of OPA-1, the crista goes from an organized structure to a disorganized structure where we have more vacuolization. And when the crista are formed and they're tight, they're going to have increased respiration and improved mitochondrial supercomplex formation. However, when we have vacuolization and loss of crista formation, that means that we're going to have decreased respiration and the respiratory supercomplex are going to basically fall apart. And that's going to lead to excess reactive oxygen species, oxidative stress, and ultimately mitochondrial heteroplasmy, decreased bioenergetics of the cell, and really the beginnings of disease. So cardiolipin is an important fatty acid that is found in the inner mitochondrial membrane. I'll be frank, I learned about cardiolipin in the context of what we call anti-cardiolipin antibodies for people who have pulmonary embolus or a hypercoagulable state in medical school. I had no idea what cardiolipin actually was. I was not taught its structure. I was not taught its function. I was not taught its importance for mitochondrial health. And I'm going to transmit that information to you today. Right. The role of cardiolipin in mitochondrial function and dynamics in health and disease, molecular and pharmacologic aspects. So in eukaryotic cells, the cells that we all are, mitochondria are involved in a large array of metabolic and bioenergetic processes that are vital for cell survival. That, I think, if you're a mitochondriac and have been with us for a while, know that pretty straightforward. Phospholipids are the main building blocks of mitochondrial membranes. You may not have known that. So as we talked about, the inner mitochondrial membrane and the outer mitochondrial membrane, well, those are made up of lipids. It's a lipid bilayer. And it's the same on the actual cell membrane. Now, the fatty acid and lipid content is going to be vastly different between those potentially, but they are both lipid membranes. And cardiolipin, CL, is a unique phospholipid which is localized and synthesized in the inner mitochondrial membrane. So this is a special phospholipid that is specific to the inner mitochondrial membrane. It is now widely accepted that cardiolipin plays a central role in many reactions and processes involved in mitochondrial function and dynamics. Cardiolipin interacts with and is required for optimal activity of several inner mitochondrial membrane proteins, including the enzyme complexes of the ECT or electron transport chain and ATP production and for their organization into super complexes. So cardiolipin, like the actual proteins on the mycos, is a critical factor for crista formation and super complex formation. So this is something we got to pay close attention to. And this is something that's going to be a recurring theme, especially when we hit the mitochondrial redox micro series, because we're going to see that when cardiolipin is damaged by ROS, by inflammation, then we're going to see disease form after that. Moreover, Cardiolipin plays an important role in mitochondrial membrane morphology, stability, and dynamics in mitochondrial biogenesis and protein import in mitophagy and different mitochondrial steps of the apoptotic process. Now, you can see here, this is far-reaching beyond super complex formation, beyond energy production, beyond ROS production. We're talking about mitochondrial dynamics now. Biogenesis, fission, fusion, and mitophagy are all reliant on proper cardiolipin content and structural integrity. It is conceivable that abnormalities in cardiolipin content, composition, and level of oxidation may negatively impact mitochondrial functions and dynamics with important implications in a variety of pathophysiologic situations and diseases. In this review, we focus on the role played by cardiolipin in mitochondrial function and dynamics in health and disease and on potential pharmacologic modulation of CL through several agents in attenuating mitochondrial dysfunction. So let's zoom over to this graphic on the right. Cardiolipin is going to improve the ECT complexes and super complex formation. It's also going to have important roles for mitochondrial biogenesis, protein import into the mitochondria, metabolic carriers. It's going to be related to other mitochondrial dynamics, fission and fusion, as well as mitophagy. It's going to be responsible for cytochrome release and apoptosis when there's damage. It's going to be important for the dimerization of ATP synthase and the inner mitochondrial membrane cristae formation and the mitochondrial transition pore. It plays a very central role. And it is far reaching beyond, obviously, the mitochondrial supercomplex, which has its own critical importance.
So this is just a zoomed in view of the inner mitochondrial membrane. We have the matrix and we have the inner mitochondrial membrane space where the protons are pumped to. And you can see this lipid bilator here. And you can see that some of them are phosphatidylcholines, phosphatidylserines, cardiolipin, and other phospholipids that make up this mitochondrial membrane. The structure of the mitochondrial lipid membrane is made up of 18% cardiolipin by phospholipid mass. The other 34% is phosphatidyl ethanolamide segregated to the negatively curved monolayer leaflet facing the crystal lumen while opposing positively curved matrix facing monolayer contains predominantly phosphatidylcholine. Membrane phospholipids are critically important for mitochondrial function, mitochondrial crystal formation, but there's a special importance given to cardiolipin. It is almost the mitochondria's sensor to the environment because cardiolipin is exquisitely sensitive to reactive oxygen species and oxidative stress. And when there's oxidative stress, it's going to have an important effect on cardiolipin oxidation status, which we'll see here, is critically important for complex formation. We have a normal membrane. When you add cardiolipin, you automatically start to form the mitochondrial cristae, and you get a super complex that is formed adequately. Here we have efficient electron transport, we have efficient proton transport, we have efficient ATP production, and we have a limitation of reactive oxygen species. And we're going to touch on this in greater detail during the mitochondrial redox micro series. But as you can see here, when there's an excess of oxidative stress, cardiolipin becomes oxidized or there's a peroxidation of cardiolipin, which is going to damage crystal formation, which is going to dissolve the mitochondrial supercomplex, and it's going to lead to a decrease in energy production, an inefficiency of electron transport, which is going to, believe it or not, as you'll see later, snowball into more reactive oxygen species, and round and round we go to mitochondrial dysfunction, increasing heteroplasmy, and cellular damage as a whole. The last factor I want to hit before we close today is going to be the ATP synthase. The ATP synthase or complex five is where all the magic happens and ATP is actually produced. We've looked at it structurally. It's amazing nanomotor machine. It spins at 9,000 revolutions per second. It's unbelievable. And it forms the base of the mitochondrial cristae. And when the cristae are actually formed, it sits at the base of the cristae and it's going to help keep the bottom portion of the cristae tight and formed. As we talked about the OPA1 protein, protein, forming the cristae at the top of the actual cristae. This helps pull together the bottom part of the cristae to keep it formed. And what it's saying is the dimeric form of ATP synthase, which means there's two proteins, two ATP synthases that come together. As you can see in this diagram right here, they come together. The dimeric form of ATP synthase provides the protein with a spontaneous curvature that sustain their arrangement at the rim of the high curvature edges of mitochondrial membrane cristae. Also a direct interaction with cardiolipin. Again, cardiolipin playing a central role, a lipid present in the inner mitochondrial membrane also induces the dimerization of ATP synthase molecules along cristae. The deletion of those biochemical interactions abolishes the protein dimerization producing an altered mitochondrial function and morphology. So mitochondrial ATP synthase is also important, but as you can see by this paper, it is also highly affected by not only the mycos itself, the mycos proteins, but cardiolipin is also critically important for this to happen. And it, it works as a team. If OPA1 is out, then super complex can't form. If cardiolipin is oxidized and or deficient, you're going to have impaired mitochondrial crystal formation, no super complex, no efficiency. If you have an inhibition of dimerization of the ATP synthase, you're going to have inefficient mitochondrial transport and super complex formation. It acts as a, as a unit, even though there are many, many parts to this. And this is just another cool graphic showing that the ATP synthases dimerize at the bottom of these cristae and they form these structures that are unbelievable, really. I mean, these are, these are in every mitochondria of every part of your body right now. So it has to be the two together that form the, the cristae. They'll spontaneously form these dimers and help with crystal formation. But as we saw in the last paper, cardiolipin has an effect on that happening effectively. These are the little known facts about mitochondria, mitochondrial function, ATP production, mitochondrial efficiency, mitochondrial super complex formation that you're probably not going to get anywhere else. I want to bring this information to you because it's clinically relevant. The medical literature is becoming more and more clear that these are going to have important clinical outcomes, whether it be for cancer, whether it be for diabetes, whether it be for obesity, whether it be for neurodegeneration, such as Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, et cetera, whether it be for heart diseases. Basically the major killers that we're all dealing with as patients and humans 
but also as clinicians and healthcare providers within our medical system in the Western world, this has a direct impact. And as a matter of fact, Big Pharma is working overtime producing and developing drugs that can help keep the mitochondrial super complexes formed for heart failure and for heart related issues. And I believe there's going to be an expansion of these type of clinical interventions from even mainstream medicine to maintain mitochondrial super complex formation and efficient electron transfer and ATP production for a variety of conditions. That being said, if we understand as patients and as health minded individuals, how these complexes are formed, what are the factors that maintain morphology and function of mitochondria, we can act as our own mitochondrial clinician to help stave off mitochondrial related disorders, diseases, and reverse mitochondrial dysfunction and mitochondrial heteroplasmy. And as a mitochondriac, I would hope that you would be excited about that. I sure am. If you like videos like this, please like it, share, subscribe, and until next time.